Okay, let's begin. So welcome to sensors. <clears throat> so if, uh, before proceeding, I would like to acknowledge funding from both National Science Foundation and National Institute of Health. And our MD2K Center is funded by the Big Data Technology Initiative at NIH. So let me first talk about what can you get if you use mobile sensors. Uh, so I'll talk about three things. First is you could get a variety of exposure measurements. So, and why is this promising? Because, I mean, so whether we talk about mobile phones or other emerging wearable devices like smart watches, they are becoming part of our habit that uh, now when we do get out of the house and head for office, we do, I mean, most of the times, remember to take our phone with us or wear the watches. So if it's part of our habit, can we leverage them and make use of the capability, sensing capabilities that these devices possess for health monitoring as well as improvement? So the first GPS is embedded in the smartphone itself. And so from GPS, what you could obtain is exposure to various places. What places does a person go to? And, uh, <clears throat> and therefore, I mean, what they might be exposed to. How much time do they spend at home? How much time do they spend at work? How much time do they spend on the road? How much time do they spend on in a sports arena? And, uh, and a variety of other things. Uh, there are light sensors embedded in the smart watches from which you could get exposure to how much uh, daylight that they are exposed to. Uh, there are UV sensors as well. You could get UV exposures out of them. You could also, I mean, there are uh, microphones also embedded, so you could get sound exposures uh, from measurements. And it is feasible to in, uh, integrate uh, environmental sensors, so that could give you the environmental exposure. So again, you know, the benefit of a smartphone is that we interface with it quite, uh, for quite, some, uh, quite a few times. Uh, I mean, we, uh, uh, we interact with it quite a few times. And the um, benefit of the smartwatch is that, uh, unlike the smartphone, that it very well complements is that it is exposed to our ambience. So whatever we are exposed to, smartwatches, because they are on the exposed part of the body, they can capture that as well. And so that's the benefit, I mean, so that's why these uh, light sensors or UV sensors or, I mean, environmental sensors, I mean, it's much better to integrate them on a smartwatch rather than uh, the use the ones that are on the smartphone. Uh, in the smartphone, you could use GPS, you could use barometers because they don't require any exposure to your ambience. So, uh, so I only provided a very small snapshot of exposure measurements you could get from sensors. And the similar sensors can also help you measure behaviors, daily behaviors. So let me just take one small example, which is the uh, of inertial sensors, so accelerometer and gyroscope that are included in the, in the activity trackers, and also on the smartphones. So you could measure sedentary behaviors, and uh, that they, are, they, are, uh, they do quite well today. You could also, by capturing the motion of the arm, if the these sensors, these smartwatches are worn on the dominant arm, then you could measure eating behaviors. You could also measure smoking behaviors. So all via this, I mean, just one suite of sensors. Uh, then via other sensors, you could measure I mean, uh, drinking behaviors or cocaine use or drug use behaviors, or you could also measure conversation behavior. So there are a variety of behaviors that can be measured continuously uh, but if we just use, I mean, few sensors. So third, so we have just thus far only talked about risk factors. So even measurement of risk factors by itself is pretty useful, but uh, sensors also provide us a way to measure symptoms and outcomes. And that's what makes them a lot more powerful. So for example, by using physiological sensors, you could uh, get a measurement of stress levels. By using, say, a microphone, you could uh, get, a, uh, get some measure of depression. By using, say, smart eyeglasses that look inward, you could potentially get a uh, measure of fatigue. Uh, by blowing onto a, uh, a smartphone's microphone, you could potentially have a measurement of uh, asthma symptoms. Uh, the sensor that uh, Jew is developing with Emre. <laughs> Uh, the easy sense, you could uh, have a measurement of lung fluid congestion as well as cardio, uh, cardio respiratory systems movement patterns. 
So, so now I provided three distinct uh, functionality, three distinct capabilities you could get from sensors. You could get exposure measurements, you could get measurement of behaviors, you could get measurements of outcomes. So how could we use all this together? So uh, <clears throat> the, the, these sensors together, what you can do is you can make use of them for detection, prediction, and adaptation. So let me explain what I mean. So first is early detection. So by using sensors like EasySense that detect fluid congestion, you could potentially have an early detection of uh, progression in lung fluid congestion. And if so, you can intervene well uh, early enough and prevent rehospitalization, which is in the best interest of the patient as well as the healthcare system. Uh, so now if you have these indices of health status, whether it's a stress, whether it's uh, I mean, uh, lung fluid congestion, that gives you uh, from an, uh, an independent variable right? that you can try to predict by using other sensor measurements. So for example, you could, I mean, so say we're trying to predict stress, you could look at the driving uh, from a status from GPS, you could look at sudden braking from GPS, right? You could uh, look at conversation status, you could look at, okay, the person is currently in office and, I mean, is in the conversation that could point to a stress. So there are a variety of other sensor data you can use to predict the outcome. And if you are able to predict, then you can use those measurements to trigger a just-in-time intervention. So, <clears throat> so prediction can lead to prevention if we utilize them in just-in-time intervention. The third part here is adapt. That means you can also make use of the sensors to understand the context surrounding the person, and you can use that to assess, say, availability of the person, or preferences of the person, or also effect of intervention. So by, I mean, by making use of their environmental context, you can adapt the intervention and make it more and more personalized and ultimately realize this precision, the vision of precision medicine. So uh, I'll give you two examples that we are addressing in MD2K. One is a smoking cessation. So we use the uh, I mean, arm movements and the respiration measurements to detect the smoking, which I'll describe in a little more detail. And if we can uh, detect the smoking behaviors, and if we can detect the first lapses in the smoking cessation attempts, then we can look at other sensor data, such as, say, stress levels, activity levels, or exposure to environmental cues to see if they are potent predictors, and if so, then they can be used in designing just-in-time interventions. And the similar story, uh, I mean, that uh, similar framework we are applying to congestive heart failure, where you're using the easy sense and variety of other sensors like movements and, and weight measurements, or uh, the balance measurements to detect uh, onset of congestion. And then we look at other, uh, other behaviors such as, say, fast food eating, uh, or mo movements and use that to predict the worsening or improvement in congestion. And if so, then those could be used for just-in-time intervention. So let me talk about then some guiding principles as to when any of us who are into, into the sensor world, when we start looking at a sensing problem, how do we go about it? So, so when we identify a sensor, there are a variety of different decisions that go into the choice of a sensor that we are either going to build or adopt. Uh, so first is it should be wearable. Uh, that means people should be willing to wear it on a daily basis. So that's why an attempt should be made to uh, I mean, leverage onto such platforms that are already part of our habit. Second, it should be safe, uh, that uh, most of us would agree. Third, it should be reliable. That means we can, uh, we can trust the measurements of, from the sensors, irrespective of in what situations or what circumstances, in what environments, in what postures the measurements were taken. Because these are, again, mobile health means that you are able to monitor and improve health in the natural environment where there is no supervision whatsoever and there are no constraints to the lifestyle of the person that you are monitoring. So hence, the importance of reliability and robustness in, this, in the sensor becomes even more uh, critical. And the last point here is versatile. So what I mean is that uh, I mean, a person, like the comment Susan made, is that a person doesn't have just one condition. It's a person as a whole, and we need to look at the person as a whole. So a variety of conditions may need to be monitored for a person, even though you're interested in just improving one aspect of it. So if so, we can't ask a person to wear 10 different sensors, one for each condition, that it's not workable. 
So, yeah, so therefore, we need to look for vers I mean, versatility. Sometimes, the, I mean, the thinking is that, okay, I mean, uh, if I'm a domain expert, I ask, okay, I mean, I want you, the sensing expert, to, here is what I'm interested in, give me a sensor that can do this. And if the sensor expert comes and says, okay, let's try to rework uh, and see if we can derive this measurement out of something that I have already developed, then they think, no, no, then you are thinking about you have a hammer and you, you are looking for a nail. It's not that. I mean, it's not that simple. I mean, if we want these, these sensors to be adopted, we have to look for versatility. We have to look at minimizing the burden of the patient uh, at the same time achieving the right, uh, right reliability. Okay. So next comes, is if suppose we have the right sensors and most of these are actually wearable, so that means they uh, collect data, but they wirelessly transmit that data to the mobile phone. So there is, a, there is software that goes into the sensor itself. And if any of you are interested in what Ju is doing, you can talk to her. And she, she can tell you about the software that goes onto the sensor. And then there is software on the, the pairing software on the mobile phone that receives that data and then processes that data and then is able to make the inferences. So there are a variety of different issues that can emerge there, like the right sampling, the software should not crash, the, there should be minimum losses in the wireless transmission, and then I mean the battery should last long enough that you can use at least your phone throughout the day. The storage should be reliable, and so. And then uh, the next is that the inference that you make. Uh, I mean, so if suppose you got great amount of data, very I mean good quality data from a sensor that tells you that this is the amount of acceleration in terms of gravity that you got from the sensor. What are you going to do with it? So unless you convert the sensor measurements to usable measures, that's not going to be very useful. So, uh, so it's the interpretation, this inference process, that is pretty challenging. So the first issue is that of dealing with uh, confounders. So if suppose I want to detect smoking by uh, tracking the movement of the arms, then <clears throat> the movement of the arms happens similarly when I'm eating too. So if uh, all the sensor is going to tell me that there was a movement of the arm from somewhere to the mouth and then back. Now, was the person eating or smoking? If we confuse the two, we could de declare that as soon as the person left the, the clinic after the uh, quit attempt, oh, the, uh, and they went to get a burger, we'll say, oh, the person has started smoking. And then, again, the system is useless. Now, if suppose our interest is actually detecting eating itself. So, I mean, uh, sometimes we eat with a spoon, sometimes we eat with fork, sometimes we eat on, seated on a table, other times we eat, uh, I mean, uh, while uh, standing. Sometimes we eat with both hands. Uh, I mean, one hand, a burger. Sometimes we eat with both hands. There is so much variability, uh, I mean, in this act, very, uh, the same activity that we engage in for a same person. And then think about the variability across persons. So therefore, coming up with one model, one computational model that converts sensor data day in, day out on a continuous basis from the raw sensor measurements, noisy raw sensor measurements, to reliable inference, that's non-trivial. And, and fortunately, it's non-trivial for computer scientists because that's what allows them to make a career out of it. <laughs> so, so let me try to quickly go through, uh, very rapidly, and <laughs> go through an example of detecting a smoking lapse from uh, arm movement and respiration movement. So what you see here are just some sensor measurements. Uh, the lower one is the accelerometry, the upper one is the respiration. You'll see a measurement, of, I mean, uh, this is an example that Hilol uh, is here. I mean, he is the one who collected and, and drew this picture. So the hand reaches the mouth, and when hand reaches the mouth and then leaves the mouth, that's when a, a puff is taken, so that means chest cavity expansion, so that's what you see in the respiration measurement. So by looking at both the sensor sensing modalities, it is feasible to detect a smoking. But if you combine the data from accelerometry or inertial measurements taken from the wrist and the respiration measurements collected at the chest level. So, but there are major challenges, like there are 200 times, uh, I mean, every hour that we have our hand reaching the mouth. Out of these ones, which one is the one that corresponds to, <laughs> corresponds to smoking? If we think about smoking, it's only one, bre uh, one breathing cycle. There are 1,000 breathing cycles every hour. <laughs> Which of these corresponds to smoking? What if I was just taking a yawn, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and then as I described, there are personal situational variabilities. Sometimes the sensor is loose. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's not placed appropriately. Sometimes there are noises, confounds, a variety of different issues. 
So they stood, um, I'll just go through this quickly and I'm happy to talk about this uh, separately on a one-to-one -one basis, just so I can respect the time. Uh, so uh, so this, uh, my students and uh, uh, my collaborators together, they developed this method who, that were able to uh, segment the continuous time series data to identify the candidates that may represent a, a smoking-like signature. And then they developed an adaptive method to identify the boundaries in this continuous sensor data stream that should be assessed whether it represents a smoking event or not that can adapt to all these various situations, adapt across people. And, uh, and, <clears throat> and then we have, I mean, so from this entire ti continuous time series of sensor data, uh, they were able to identify the set of candidates. But that still makes for many candidates throughout the day. So they uh, came up with different methods to uh, uh, reduce the number of candidates that needs to be assessed for whether it represents smoking or not. So first is, I mean, was there appropriate level of movement? I mean, so the level of movement in the arm, was it uh, I mean, strong enough? Uh, I mean, how long was the hand at the mouth? So that also I mean, reduced, uh, I mean, when, when they looked at the smoking data that they had collected in the training data from that, they could find the right thresholds. And then uh, when, you, when you're smoking versus eating, the orientation of the wrist or the hand is little, a little unique. So they looked at the pitch and roll and tried to find the right uh, I mean, boundaries on these particular features that describes, captures this specific orientation of the hand during smoking. So, and then, I mean, they developed a machine learning model by constructing features from both uh, inertial sensors and respiration, and, and then they uh, I mean, were able to develop a model that can identify individual smoking puffs. But the smoking usually consists of several puffs that are spaced apart. And so, the next uh, stage was in order to make, the, make this model more robust. Uh, they were looking at okay, how far, I mean, uh, if there, are, there is only one puff, it's possible it might be only one puff that somebody took, but usually it's not the case. So therefore, if there is only one puff and there is no other puff in its close vicinity, then that's, that's removed. Further, uh, I mean, we looked at, okay, how many minimum puffs we should consider in a smoking episode for it to uh, be declared as a positive case. So they looked at I mean, uh, various values like two smoking puffs, three smoking puffs, four smoking puffs. So, and this data, I mean, what you see in the bottom, this was trained on a, I mean, real life smoking cessation data. And what they found is that if minimum number of puffs is taken as two, that means all instances of first lapse would, will be detected. But then it, leave, it does produce some I mean, more false alarms than we would like, about uh, 1.6 every day. Uh, so, but uh, I mean, re restricting it to four minimum puffs in a smoking a smoking session that makes it uh, for uh, I mean good performance. <clears throat> so uh, this is the performance on the training data. If we use only wrist or only respiration, then we don't get as good of a result as I mean uh, compared to if we use both the resp respiration and the wrist measurements. And this summarizes the results that we were able to obtain on. A smoking, I mean, so we developed a model uh, from, the, from a training data collected on six smokers and applied it to a smoking cessation study data where we had, uh, I mean, uh, we, we had about 60 uh, participants. And in there, as you can see, we had about one over six, that means one false positive detected every six days uh, in the, in the, in the post-quit uh, post days. And uh, 28 out of 32 first lapses were detected. So let me present some very uh, I mean, uh, interesting findings. So first, remember we said four is the minimum number of puffs that will uh, require for a smoking episode to be detected as smoking episode. As you can see, there are several such, uh, I mean, several participants whose first lapse did consist of only four puffs, as opposed to, four, I mean, about 15 is what's usual in, in the pre-quit days. So, I mean, the first puff usually consists of a smaller number of puffs, uh, the, the first lapse. So, I mean, in terms of lapse, lapse progression on the lapse day, it's about total number of seven, I mean, eight puffs that people take throughout the day. Uh, day after lapse, it's about 26. <laughs> Second day after lapse, it's about 40. And regular smoking, smoking days consists of about 150 smoking uh, puffs per day. 
So the main issue, of, why did we go on to develop this detection of a smoking lapse was to pinpoint exactly when the smoking lapse occurred so that if suppose a person I mean, uh, is in the quit phase, uh, they started, uh, I mean, we look at their GPS data, they were at office, then they stopped at a gas station, then they went to a bar, then they came home, and at the home they reported, I lapsed. Now, where is it that they lapsed? At the gas station, at the bar, in the office? We wouldn't know. So we looked at the delay in the self-report of a smoking lapse, and the, what we see is that there is wide variation in how delayed or early the smoking lapse report is when people self-report. And if they don't self-report and they try to recall in the lab next day when they are, are tested on the CO monitor, then it's even, even worse. So uh, as I said, I mean, most of the work was done by my uh, students and collaborators. I, I get the uh, fortune of being able to talk about it. Uh, so next, I would launch into uh, I mean, why I work with sensing experts. So MD2K, this is the team of MD2K. As you can see, a wide variety of institutions. and an amazing group of investigators, several of whom are here, and you'll hear from Jim Ray, our deputy director, next. And then from health research, uh, again, we are very fortunate to have an amazing group of people. So why do all these people, I mean, work, work with us? I'll, I'll get to that. So let me quickly talk about the key questions. So, I mean, so first key question we ask is, I mean, what sensors are needed for the target measure? And as I described, I mean, that we look for certain properties so that we have best chances of adoption. Then next question, as computer scientists, we ask is how sensitive and specific is the inference? I mean, so uh, what is the gold standard we are going to compare it with? Can other people reproduce? I mean, what I developed, I mean, is the, is the testing uh, done only in the lab or is it done in the field? If, it does, if it's done in the field, I mean, was it in the entire day or was it only some specific portions of the day? Was it, I mean, done for how many days or um, across how many participants? Uh, then how efficient is, the, is this computational model? Does it uh, deplete the battery life or I mean, uh, I mean does, is it so heavy that its computation needs to be offloaded to the cloud or I mean, can it be implemented on the phone for real-time computation? And uh, how much time does it take for this inference to, uh, to compute? And uh, I mean, we also look for ways to maximize adoption by others, so release of core data or collaboration. And one important thing is that, remember, we are all computing researchers. So that means we have the same academic, similar academic careers as health researchers. So unless whatever we do is respected by the most respected computer scientists, those students who are working on it will not be able to make their careers. So ultimately, this has to be respected well. So why collaborate with sensing experts? I mean, because if you're looking for continuous measurements or sensor-triggered interventions, then I mean, uh, Working with sensing experts is a necessity because analyzing the sensor data and their implementation on the phone, efficient implementation, still requires computing research. It's not a done deal yet. We hope that it will soon be in future, then we can move on to another problem. Uh, <clears throat> but novelty comes with a very high price because there is uncertainty. And if you are the first adopter of, the, of whatever new system is developed, then there will be multiple failures before, before there is eventual success. So if you would like to get in touch with me, uh, here is my contact information. I'm ready for questions. Thank you.